Bonjour à tous et à toutes, j'espère que vous allez tous et toutes très bien. Bienvenue dans une nouvelle vidéo. Après avoir bien galéré pour euh, installer mon setup d'enregistrement, nous sommes partis euh, pour la lecture de Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. En effet, euh, j'adore lire en anglais et je voulais faire un petit test avec vous, euh, pourquoi pas. Euh, et euh, vous lire en anglais, donc vous pouvez très bien écouter cette vidéo euh, en faisant autre chose, en mode podcast. Euh, J'ai mis la webcam, mais voilà. Il est très joli, je vais le rendre à une amie quand je l'aurai fini. Euh, donc euh, Cette édition, c'est l'édition Serpentard, Slytherin, voilà. Donc dès que je l'aurai fini, je le rendrai. Alors, déjà on a en première page, du coup, euh, les, euh, comment on appelle ça, les valeurs de Slytherin, donc c'est Pride, Ambition, Cunning. Donc Pride c'est la fierté, Ambition c'est l'ambition, et Cunning je ne sais plus. Alors, en fait, j'ai toujours aimé lire en anglais, c'est une langue qui me passionne. Et du coup, euh, en plus j'adore Harry Potter. Euh, donc c'est parti pour vous lire Harry Potter en anglais. Euh, donc là, il est actuellement 14h45. Et donc, là je me suis mis en petite ambiance cocooning, j'ai ma petite chatoune derrière. Euh, je suis en fait, j'ai branché mon téléphone sur l'ordinateur en guise de caméra. C'est ça qui a été le plus galère à faire. Et du coup, ça me sert aussi de micro parce que, en fait, j'ai aussi mon Blue Yeti qui est juste là. Mais je sais pas, il ne veut pas, il ne veut pas fonctionner. Quand le, la caméra et le micro sont sur l'ordi, sur, sur le, le portable. Voilà. Allez, je vous partage sur cette chaîne toutes mes passions, y compris lire en anglais. Alors, c'est parti. Chapter 1 The Boy Who Lived Mr. and Mrs. Dursley of Number 4, Private Drive, were proud to say that they were perfectly normal. Thank you very much. They were the last people you'd expect to be involved in anything strange or mysterious, because they just didn't hold with such nonsense. Mr. Dursley was the director of a firm called Cranings, which made drills. He was a big, beefy man with hardly any neck although he didn't have a very large moustache. Mrs. Dursley was thin and blonde and had nearly twice the usual amount of neck which came in very useful as she spent so much of her time craning over garden fences. Spying on the neighbors, the Dursleys had a small son called Dudley and in their opinion There was no thinner boy anywhere. The Dursleys had everything they wanted, but they also had a secret, and their greatest fear was that somebody would discover it. They didn't think they could bear it if anyone found out about the Potters. Mrs. Potter was Mrs. Dursley's sister, but they hadn't met for several years. In fact, Mrs. Dursley pretended she didn't have a sister, because her sister and her good-for-nothing husband were as in Dursleyish as it was possible to be. The Dursleys shuddered to think what the neighbors would say if the porters arrived in the streets. The Dursleys knew that the Potters had a small son, 
too, but they have never ever seen him. This boy was another good reason for keeping the potters away. They didn't want Dudley mixing with a child like that. When Mr. and Mrs. Dursley woke up on the door, Great Tuesday or story starts. There was nothing about the cloudy sky outside. To suggest that strange and mysterious things would soon be happening all over the country. Mr. Dursley hummed as he picked out his most boring tie for work, and Mrs. Dursley gossiped away happily as she wrestled, like screaming Dudley into his high chair. None of them noticed a large tiny owl floated past the window. At half past eight, Mr. Dursley picked up his briefcase, paid Mrs. Dursley on the check, and tried to kiss Dursley. Goodbye, but missed because Dudley was now having a tantrum and throwing his cereal at the walls. Little tyke, chattered Mr. Dursley as he left the house. He got into his car and bailed out of number four's drive. It was in the corner of the street that he noticed the first sign of something peculiar. A cat reading a map. For a second, Mr. Dursley didn't realize what he had seen. Then he jerked his head around to look again. There was a tabby cat standing on the corner of Private Drive, but there wasn't a map inside. What could he have been thinking of? It must have been a trick of the line. Mr. Dursley blinked and stared at the cat. It stared back as Mr. Dursley drove around the corner and up the road. He watched the cat in his mirror. It was now reading the sign that said Private Drive. No, looking at the sign, cats couldn't read maps or signs. Mr. Dursley gave himself a little shake and put the cat out of his mind. As he drove towards town, he thought of nothing except a large order of trees he was hoping to get that day. But on the edge of town, trees were driven out of his mind by something else. As he sat in the usual morning traffic jam, he couldn't have noticing that there seemed to be a lot of strangely dressed people over, people about, people in cloaks. Mr. Dursley couldn't bear people who dressed in funny clothes. The get-ups you saw on young people. He supposed this was some stupid new fashion. He drummed his fingers on the steering wheel and his eyes fell on the huddle of these weirdos standing quite close by. They were whispering excitedly together. Mr. Dursley was enraged to see that a couple of them were young or old. Why, that man had to be older than he was, and wearing a emerald green cloak to nerve him. But then it struck Mr. Dursley that if this was probably some city stunt, these people were obviously collecting it for something. Yes, that would be it. The traffic moved on, and a few minutes later, Mr. Dursley arrived in, in the Granny Car Park, his mind back on dream. Mr. Dursley always sat with his back to the window in his office on the ninth floor. If he hadn't, he might have found it 
harder to concentrate on drills that morning. He didn't see the owls swooping past in broad daylight. The people down in the street did. They pointed and gazed open-mouthed as owl after owl sped overhead. Most of them had never seen an owl even at night time. Mr. Dusty, however, had a bird perfectly normal owl friend moment. He yelled at five different people. He made several important telephone calls and shouted a bit more. He was in a very good mood until lunchtime when he felt he'd stretch his legs and walk across the road to buy himself a bun from the baker's opposite. He'd, forgot, he'd forgotten all about the people in cloaks until he passed a group of them next to the bakers. He hides them angrily as he passed. He didn't know why, but they made him uneasy. Bislow were whispering excitedly, too, and he couldn't see a single collecting tip. It was on his way back past them, clutching a large donut in a bag. But he caught a few words of what they were saying. The butters, that's right, that's what I heard. Yes, there soon. Hurry. Mr. Dursley stopped them. Fell foot in him. He looked back at the whisperers as if he wanted to say something to them, but felt better of it. He dashed back across the road, hurried up to his office, snapped at his secretary not to disturb him, seized his telephone and had almost finished, dialing his home number when he changed his mind. He put the receiver back down and stroked his mustache thinking, no, he was being stupid. Potter wasn't such an, an unusual name. He was sure. There were lots of people called Potter who had a, cool, who had a son called Harry. Come to think of it, he wasn't even sure his nephew was called Harry. He never even seen the boy. It might have been Harvey or Howard. There was no point in worrying Mrs. Dursley. She always got so upset at any mention of her sister. He didn't blame her. If he'd had a sister like that, but all the same, those people in cloaks. He found it a lot harder concentrate. Andreas, that afternoon, and when he left the building at five o'clock, he was still so worried that he walked straight into someone just outside the door. Sorry, he groaned, as the tiny old man stumbled and almost fell. It was a few seconds before Mr. Dursley realized that the man was wearing a vile cloak. He didn't seem at all upset at being almost knocked to the ground. On the contrary, his face split into a white smile, and he said in a squeaky voice that made passers-by stare, Don't be sorry, my dear sir, for nothing could upset me today. Rejoice, for you know who has gone at last. Even mogos like yourself should be celebrating this happy, happy day. And she home, and the old man hugged Mr. Dursley around the middle and walked off. Mr. Dursley stood rubbed to a spot. He had been hurt by a complete stranger. He also felt he had been called a muggle, whatever that was. 
was rattled. He hurried to his car and set off home, hoping he was imagining things which he had never hoped before because he didn't approve of imagination. As he pulled into the driveway on number four, the first thing he saw, and it didn't improve his mood, was the tabby cat he'd spotted that morning. It was now sitting on his garden wall. He was sure it was the same one. It had the same markings around its eyes. Shoo, said Mr. Dusty loudly. The cat didn't move. It just gave him a stern look. What is normal cat behavior? Mr. Dusty wondered, trying to pull himself together. He let himself into the house. He was still determined not to mention anything to his wife. Mrs. Dursley had, had had a nice, normal day. She told him of a dinner all about Mrs. Next Door's problems with her daughter and how Dudley had learned a new word, shan't. Mr. Dursley tried to act normally. When Dudley had been to bed, he went into the living room in time to catch the last ripple on the evening news. And finally, bird watchers everywhere have reported that the nation's owls have been behaving very unusually today. Although owls normally hunt at night and are hardly ever seen in their light. There have been hundreds of sightings of these birds flying in every direction since sunrise. Experts are unable to explain why the owls have suddenly changed their sleeping pattern. The newsreader alone himself agreed. Most mysterious. And now, over to Jim McGuffin with the weather. Going to be any more showers of owls tonight, Jim? Well, Ted, said the weatherman, I don't know about that, but it's not only the owls that have been acting oddly today. Viewers have spotted about us Ken, Yorkshire, and Dandy have been phoning in to tell me that instead of the rain I promised yesterday, they've had a downpour of shooting stars. Perhaps people have been celebrating bonfire night early. It's not until next week, folks. But I can promise a wet night today. But I can promise a wet night tonight. Mr. Dursley sat frozen in his armchair, shouting stars all of Britain. Owls flying by daylight, mysterious people in cloaks all over the place, and a whisper, a whisper about the potters. Mrs. Dursley came into the living room carrying two cups of tea. It was no good. He'd have to say something to her. He cleared his throat nervously. Er, uh, Petunia, dear. You haven't heard from your sister lately, have you? As he had expected, Mrs. Dursley looked shocked and angry. After all, they normally pretended she didn't have a sister. No, she said sharply. Why? Funny stuff on the news, Mr. Dursley mumbled. I was shouting stars. And there was a lot of funny looking people in town today. So, snapped Mrs. Dursley. Well, I just thought, maybe, it was something to do with. You know, a lot. Mrs. Dursley sipped her tea through pursed lips. Mr. Dursley wondered whether he dared tell her he'd heard the name Potter. He decided he didn't dare. Instead, he said, as casually, as he could. Their son, 
it'd be about this place H now, wouldn't it? I suppose so, say Mrs. Dursley stiffly. What's his name again? Howard, isn't it? Harry, nasty, common name, if you task me. Oh, yes, say Mr. Dursley, his heart sinking horrible. Yes, I quite agree. He didn't say another word on the subject as they went upstairs to bed. When Mrs. Dursley was in the bedroom, Mr. Dursley crept to the bedroom window and peered down into the front garden. The cat was still there. It was tearing down the private drive. He felt it was waiting for something. Was he imagining things? Could all this have anything to do with the puppies? If it did, if it got out that they were related to a pair of, well, he didn't think he could bear it. The Dursleys got into bed. Mrs. Dursley fell asleep quickly, but Mr. Dursley lay awake, turning in all, it all over in his mind. His last comforting thought before he fell asleep was that even if the parties were involved, there was no reason for them to come near him and Mrs. Dursley. The parties knew very well what he and Petunia felt about them and their kind. He couldn't see how he and Petunia could get mixed up in anything that might be going on. He yawned and turned over. It couldn't think it couldn't affect them. How very wrong he was. Mr. Dursley might have been drifting into an uneasy sleep, but the cat on the wall outside was showing no sign of sleepiness. It was sitting as still as a statue, its eyes fixed unblinkingly on the far corner of, of private drive. He didn't so much as quail when the car tower slung in the next street. No one two hours swept overhead. In fact, it was nearly midnight before the cat moved at all. A man appeared on the corner, should the cat have been watching, appeared so suddenly and silently you'd have thought. He just popped out of the ground. The cat stay twitched and its eyes narrowed. C'est pas évident. En fait, je pense que je vais vous lire juste le premier chapitre. Ça sera déjà bien. Et puis, euh, si ça vous plaît, je vous lirai les chapitres suivants. Voilà. Allez, on reprend. On reprend. Nothing like this man had ever been seen in private drive. He was tall, thin, and very old, judging by the silver of his hair and beard, which were both long enough to tuck into his belt. He was wearing long robes, a purple cloak which swept the ground in high heels, buckled boots. His blue eyes were light, bright and sparkling, behind half-moon spectacles, and his nose was very long and crooked, as though it had been broken at least twice. This man's name was Albus Dumbledore. Albus Dumbledore didn't seem to realize that he had just arrived in the street, where everything from his name to his boots was unwelcomed. 
He was busy rematching in his uh, in his cloak, looking for something, but he did seem to realize he was being watched because he looked up suddenly at the cat, which was still staring at him from the other end of the street. For some reason, the sight of the the cat seemed to amuse him. He chuckled and muttered, I should have known. He had found what he was looking for in his inside pocket. It seemed to be a silver cigarette lighter. He clicked it open, held it up, in the air and clicked it. The nearest street lamp went out with a little pop. He clicked it again, the next lamp flickered into darkness. Twelve times he clicked the third outer until the only light left in the whole street were too tiny. Pin breaks in the distance, which were the eyes of the cat watching him. If anyone looked out of the window now, even holy baby eyes. Even baby eyed Mrs. Dursley, they wouldn't be able to see anything that was happening down on the pavement. Dumbledore slipped the pet out the back inside his cloak and set off down the street toward number four, where he sat down on the wall next to the cat. He didn't look at it. But after a moment, he spoke to it. Fancy seeing you here, Professor McGonagall. He turned to smile at the tabby, but it had gone. Instead, he was smiling at the rather severe-looking woman who was wearing square glasses, exactly the shape of the markings the cat had had around its eyes. She, too, was wearing a cloak an emerald one. Her black hair was drawn into a tight bun. She looked distinctly ruffled. How did you know it was me? she asked. My dear professor, I've never seen a cat sit so stiffly. You'd be stiff if you'd be sitting on a brick wall all day, said Professor McGonagall. Oh, day, when you could have been celebrating? I must have passed a dozen feasts and parties on my way here. Professor McGonagall sniffed and grinned. Oh, yes, everyone celebrating, all right, she said impatiently. You think they'd be a bit more careful, but no, even the muggles have noticed something is going on. It was on their news. She jerked her head back on the Dursley's dark living room window. I heard E. Roxon howled. Shooting star. Well, they're not completely stupid. They were bound to notice something. Shouting star is down in Kent. I bet that was Diddle's Deagle. He never had much sense. You can blame them, said the launch gently. We've had precious little to celebrate for eleven years. I know that, said Professor McGonagall irritably, but that's no reason to lose our heads. People are being downright careless out on the streets in broad, broad daylight. Not even dressed in muggle clothes, swapping rumors. She threw a sharp, sideways glance at Dumbledore here, as though hoping he was going to tell her something. But he didn't, so she went on. A fine thing it will be here. On the very day, you know who seems to have this bit of math. The muggles found out about the soul. I suppose he really has gone, Dumbledore. 
It certainly seems so, said the little. We have much to be thankful for. Would you care for a sherbet, Nimmin? A what? A sherbet, Nimmin. The kind of mogul's treat I'm rather fond of. No, thank you, said Professor McGonagall coldly. I thought she didn't think this was the moment for sherbet level. As I say, even if you know who has gone. My dear professor, surely a sensible person like yourself can call him by his name? All this you-know-who nonsense for eleven years. I have been trying to persuade people to call him by his proper name, Voldemort. Professor McGonagall flinched, but Dumbledore, who was unspeaking to Sherlock Nimitz, seemed not, not to notice. It all gets so confusing. If we keep saying, you know who, I have never seen any reason to be frightened of saying Voldemort's name. I know you haven't, said Professor McGonagall, sounding half exasperated. Half unmarried, but you're different. Everyone knows you're the only one you know. Oh, all right, Voldemort was frightened of. You flatter me, said Dumbledore calmly. Voldemort. As had power I will never have, only because you're too, well, noble to you then. It's lucky it's dark. I haven't blushed so much since Madame Pomfrey told me she licked my new hammers. <laughs> Professor McGonagall showed a sharp look at Dumbledore and said, The owls are nothing to be to the aromas that are flying around. You know what everyone's saying about why he's disappeared? About what finally stopped him? It seemed that Professor McGonagall had reached the point she was most anxious to discuss. The real reason she had been waiting on a cold heart one day, for neither as a cat nor as a woman had she fixed Dumbledore with such a piercing stare as she did now. It was plain that whatever everyone was saying, she was not going to believe it until Dumbledore told her it was true. Dumbledore, however, was shooting another shove at Lemon and did not answer. What they're saying, she pressed on, is that last night Voldemort turned up in Godric's hollow. He went to find the potter. The rumor is that Lady and James Potter are, are, that they're dead. Dumbledore bowed his head. Professor McGonagall gasped. Lady and James, I can't believe it. I didn't want to believe it. Oh, how this. Dumbledore reached out and patted her on the shoulder. I know, I know, he said heavily. Professor McGonagall's voice trembled as she went on. That's not all. They're saying he tried to kill the potter's son, Harry, but he couldn't. He couldn't kill that little boy. No one knows why or how, but they're saying that when he couldn't kill Harry Potter, Voldemort's power somehow broke. And that's why he's gone. Dumbledore nodded grumly. It's, it's true, faltered Professor McGonagall. After all he's done, all the people he's killed, he couldn't kill a little boy. It's just astounding. Of all the things to stop him. But no, 
But how in the name of heaven did Harry survive? We can only guess, said Dumbledore. We may never know. Professor McGonagall pulled out a lace handkerchief and then had her eyes been at her spectacles. Dumbledore gave a great sniff as he took a golden watch from his pocket and examined it. It was a very odd watch. It had twelve hands but no numbers. Instead, little planets were moving around the edge. It must have made sense to Dumbledore, felt because he put it back in his pocket and said Hagrid Slate. I suppose it was he who told you I'd be here, by the way. Yes, said Professor McGonagall, and I don't suppose you're going to tell me why you're here. Of all places, I've come to bring Harry to his aunt and uncle. They're the only family he had left now. You don't mean, you can't mean the people who live here, cried Professor McGonagall, jumping to her feet and pointing at number four. Dumbledore, you can't. I've been watching them all day. You couldn't find two people who are less like us. And the god be son. I saw him lick, kicking his mother all the way up the street, screaming for sweets. Harry Potter, come and live here. It's the best place for him, said the model firmly. His aunt and uncle will be able to explain everything to him when he's older. I've written them a letter. A letter? repeated Professor McGonagall faintly, sitting back down on the wall. Really, Dumbledore, you think you can explain all this in a letter? These people will never understand him. He'll be famous, a legend. I wouldn't be surprised if today was known as Harry Potter Day in future, there would be books written about Harry. Every child in our world will know his name. Exactly, said Nebberdor, looking very seriously over the top of his half-moon glasses. It would be enough to turn any boy's head. Famous before, he can walk and talk. Famous for something you won't ever remember. Can you see how much better off he'll be growing up away from all that and he is ready to take it? Professor McGonagall opened her mouth, changed her mind, swallowed and then said, Yes, yes, you're right, of course. But how is the boy getting here, Dumbledore? She eyed his cloak suddenly as though she thought he might be hiding Harry underneath it. Hagrid's bringing it. You think it wise to trust Hagrid with something as important as this? I would trust Hagrid with my life, said Dumbledore. I'm not saying his heart isn't the right place. Say Professor McGonagall grud grudgingly. But you can't pretend he's not careless. He does tend to. What was that? A loud rumbling sound had broken the silence around them. It grew steadily louder as they looked up and down the street for some sign of a headlight. It swelled to a roar. I say we both looked up at the sky, and a huge motorbike fell out of the air and landed on the road in front of them. In front of them, if the motorbike was huge, it was nothing to the man sitting astride it. He was almost twice as tall as a normal man and at least five times as wide. 
and learned simply too big to be allowed. And so I, long tangles of bushy black hair and beard, his most on his face. He had hands the size of dustbin lids, and his feet in the leather boot. Leather boots were like baby dolphin. In his vast muscular arms, he was holding a bundle of blankets. Hagrid, said Dumbledore, sounding nervous. At last, and when did you get that motorbike? Borrowed it, Professor Dumbledore, sir, said the giant, climbing carefully of the motorbike as he spoke. Young Sirius Black played with me. I've got him, sir. No problems were there. No, sir. House was almost destroyed, but I got him out all right before the muggles started swarming around. He fell asleep as we was flying over Bristol. Dumbledore and Professor McGonagall then forward over the bundle of blankets. Inside, just visible, was a baby boy fast asleep. Under a tuft of jet black, jet black hair over his forehead, the cutie a curiously shaped cut. Like a bolt of lightning. Is that where? whispered Professor McGonagall. Yes, said Dumbledore. You have that scar forever. You couldn't you do something about it, Dumbledore? Even if it even if I could. I wouldn't. Scars come come in useful. I have warned myself about my left knee which is a perfect map of the London underground. Well, give him here, Hagrid. We'd better get this over with. Dumbledore took Harry in his arms and turned towards Dursley's house. Could I, could I say goodbye to him, sir? Asked Hagrid. He bent his great shaggy head over Harry and gave him what must have been a very scratchy, whiskery kiss. Then suddenly, Hagrid let out a howl, like a wounded dog. Shh, his Professor McGonagall, you wake the muggles. Sorry, thought Hagrid, taking out a large spotted handkerchief and burying his face in it. But I c- c- can't stand it. Lady and James dead. And poor little Harry after a life. And to live with the muggles. Yes, yes, it's so very sad. But get a grip on yourself, Hagrid. Or we'll be found. Professor McGonagall whispered. Patting Harry. Patting <laughs> Hagrid. Gently in on the arm as Dumbledore stepped over the low garden wall and walked to the front door. He laid Harry gently on the doorstep. Took a letter out of his cloak. Tucked it inside. Harry. Sorry. He laid Harry gently on the doorstep, took a letter out of his cloak, tucked it inside Harry's blanket, and then came back to the other two. For a full minute, the three of them stood and looked at the little bundle. Hagrid's shoulders shook, Professor McGonagall blinked furiously, and the twinkling lights that usually shone from Dumbledore's eyes 
seem to have gone out. Well, says in the door, finally that's it. We've no business staying here. We may as well go and join the celebration. Yeah, said Hagrid in a very muffled voice. I'd best get this bike away. Good night, Professor McGonagall. Professor Dumbledore, sir. Whipping his streaming eyes on his jacket sleeve, Hagrid swung himself onto the motorbike and kicked the engine into life. With a roar, it rose into the air and off into the night. I shall see you soon, I expect, Professor McGonagall, said Dumbledore, nodding to her. Professor McGonagall blew her nose in reply. Dumbledore turned and walked back down the street. On the corner, he stopped and took out a silver bird out there. He clicked it once, and twelve balls of light sped back to their street lamps, so that Private Drive rolled suddenly orange, and he could make out a, a tabby cat slinking around the corner at the other end of the street. He could just see the bundle of blankets on the step of number four. Good luck, Harry, he murmured. He murmured. He turned on his heel and with a switch of his cloak he was gone. A breeze ruffled the neat hedges of private drive, which lay silent and tidy under the inky sky, the very last place you would expect astonishing things to happen. Harry Potter rode over inside his blanket without waking up. One small hand was on the letters beside him, and he slept on, not knowing he was special, not knowing he was famous, not knowing he wouldn't be woken in a few hours, timed by Mrs. Dursley. Scream as she opened the front door to put out the milk bottles, know that he would spend the next few weeks being prodded and pinched by his cousin Dudley, he couldn't know that at this very moment people meeting in secret all over the country were holding of their glasses and saying in hushed voices to Harry Potter, the boy who lived. Voilà, c'était le premier chapitre euh, de Harry Potter et euh, à l'école des sorciers, dans son titre originel Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, donc euh, Harry Potter et la pierre philosophale. Donc j'espère que ça vous a plu et euh, dites-moi dans les commentaires si vous voulez que je continue à lire ce livre euh, dans d'autres vidéos. Ça m'a beaucoup plu, c'était pas facile, c'est... C'est pas facile de, de lire pendant presque une heure dans une autre langue que le français, quand on est français. Voilà, mais ça m'a énormément plu, j'étais bien en train de lire dans ce dimanche. Voilà. Et donc euh, la prochaine vidéo du coup sera euh, le 27. Donc le 27 c'est mardi. J'espère que voilà, ça vous a plu. Et puis, ben, je vous dis du coup à mardi pour la prochaine vidéo. Je vous aime très fort. Mouah.